Welcome to Heavy Networking from the Packet Pushers. I'm Ethan Banks, and with me is Drew Conray Murray. You can find us both on LinkedIn, where we are delighted to connect with you. On today's episode, we are talking with Tony Burke about what makes a network device tick. How does traffic move through a switch? How is a forwarding table built? What's going on in that big hunk of silicon we call a network forwarding engine? And why can't we take a generic PC and turn it into a high-speed router? Tony's a repeat guest on our podcast network with appearances as far back as 2011, if my search foo is strong today. And today's topic is Tony's idea. He's an instructor who sees a lot of folks coming through his classes with questions about how network devices do what they do. So, Tony, welcome back to Heavy Networking. You've been on you know, recently here in 2024. We've been chatting about a bunch of things. Um, but for our purposes today, as we get into uh, uh, network devices and how a packet is, is going to move through this device, what do we actually mean by network device? We're we talking about switches and routers. We talk about firewalls. Is there even a difference between a switch and a router these days? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So uh, what we're talking about is a, a, a data center switch or a WAN router, some type of layer two to layer three device. There's not really a meaningful distinction between what's a switch and a router anymore. Most of the time, it's just certain subsets of features, like how big the forwarding tables are, how big the buffers are. You know, that'll be, um, you know, that'll make the difference between whether or not we call it a switch or a router. Sometimes it's the number of interfaces, but we're talking about layer two to layer three devices. So we're not talking about things like load balancers or firewalls, which are, are going to be different in, in, in terms of how their guts work, uh, their internals work. So we're just talking about like a, you know, switch and a router. I guess the next question then is, why do we need to know this topic, Tony? What, what difference does it make if I understand how a network device works on the inside? I know, I mean, if I send frames in and frames come out, isn't that mostly what I need to know? Well, it's like it's that great quote from Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. You have to know why things work on a starship. Um, I think Tom came, you know, Tom used that in a blog post a couple of years ago, and I really like that. And it helps with troubleshooting to know, like, okay, so a packet enters a switch or a router, whether it's a layer two frame or a layer three packet. Like, how does that device make that decision? How did it come to make that decision? How is it done in software? Is it done in hardware? It helps with uh, troubleshooting to know the difference between what a routing table says, what an OSPF table says, or BGP table says, versus what's actually going on in the forwarding table, because they're all slightly different. Yeah, I agree with that. The uh, knowing the guts of how the machine actually builds tables, uh, how you might design a particular network with one piece of equipment versus another. There's a lot of devils in the details there and understanding what's actually going on under the hood can be relevant. You may make different equipment choices depending on how a device is spec and what your traffic mix is and what your goals are for performance and whether you can tolerate blocking versus non-blocking, there are budgetary differences that can come up in these devices depending on how they're configured and what's hiding under that cover. So it, it actually does matter um, how it works, what it's doing, because then as you're looking at the gear that you're trying to spec to build out a data center with, you understand what's really going on under the hood and can be intelligent in your choices that way, not just go... It's got all the acronyms. Do it. I'm sure it's fine. You, you, it's better to know a little more than that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, Tony, let's use our imaginations a bit. If we pop the cover off of a network device, router, switch, what, what are we going to be looking at? What's going? What are we going to see under there? Well, that's changed over the years. Um, today, let's take a data center switch because they're they're pretty simple, like a one or two RU switch. You pop open the hood, and you're going to see two big heat sinks. Actually, you're going to see one small heat sink and one really big heat sink. The small heat sink is, is the x86, well, typically it's up at x86, it doesn't have to be, but commonly it's x86 processor, and that's going to handle the control plane. And that's things like when you're SSHing into it, it's whatever the command line interface is, any APIs, web interfaces, whatever, that's all done on that chip. That's also where the routing protocols run, like OSPF, BGP, that runs all in the control plane, and that's handled in a, typically a generic x86 processor running a open source operating system, typically Linux, not always, but typically Linux. The big heat sink is that's going to be the, what we sometimes refer to as the ASIC. Now I don't like using the term ASIC these days because ASIC can mean a lot of different things. There's a lot of things that fall under the ASIC umbrella. So these days I try to use terms like forwarding engine or network forwarding engine, FE, and NFE, some or it could be network processor, network processing unit. There's a couple of different names for it, and there's not really, we haven't really 
uh, as an industry, haven't really settled on a name. But let's go with forwarding engine in this case. And that's responsible for the packets going in and out. Now, what is your issue with the word ASIC? Because that's how I've always understood, you know, essentially the forwarding part of the the network device. I don't want to be a pedant. I don't want to be like, oh, <laughs> hey, this is the place for it. If you're ever going to be a pedant about it. <laughs> yeah. But I, I, I do like when uh, when terminology is useful for distinction. Like, I think it helps to separate things out by terminology. Like, you know, we did an episode recently where we talked about the difference between link aggregation and LACP. When people say LACP, they typically mean link aggregation, and that's kind of a pedantic aspect to it. But it, it it's a it's a useful distinction in terms of the technology and how it all works. So my problem with ASIC um, is that ASICs can mean just about anything that's not a general CPU, and that's a pretty broad, a pr- pretty broad thing. Like, um, as an example, um, like RAID hardware cards, hardware RAID cards. Someone says, well, there's an ASIC on there to do the, um, like if you're doing some type of parity storage, like RAID 5, there's an ASIC that does that calculation. That's technically true, but it's not really because it's just, usually it's a MIPS or or ARM processor that's running at a slower speed that all, it, it's, all it's only purpose is to do those calculations, but it's not specialized really. Um, there were cryptographic ASICs that would handle the cryptographic operation that were specialty for that. So mm-hmm. ASIC... So sometimes people say, oh, this firewall has an ASIC to make things happen faster. Well, the ASIC that goes on in a firewall or a load balancer is different than the ASIC that goes into a network processor. They're very, very different. So I like having the separation of what a network processor does or an forwarding engine does because it's doing a very specific thing and it's doing it very, very well. Well, plus there's not only ASICs that are involved. I think there are some switches out there where it might not be an ASIC, it might be uh, an FPGA. Is that fair to say? Yeah, um, and I th- I think you can still probably put, again, there's not really a general consensus on this, but I would still call that a, a forwarding engine. It's just a very customizable one, a very mm-hmm. flexible one, but it's still concentrating on getting packets, layer two, layer three, IPv4, IPv6, Ethernet, those type of packets and frames in and getting them out as fast as possible. And since we're being pedantic here, let me push a little bit more. My understanding of an ASIC, uh, particularly in the context of uh, a networking device, is that the its functions were essentially fixed. Uh, you couldn't program it like a general CPU, and that's part of the definition. Is ASIC yeah. is application specific. Yeah, there is definitely a distinction between you know a lot of the Ford engines today uh, from the various vendors that make them do have some flexibility in their pipelines. So you could consider them maybe FPGAs and. I don't, you know, for our purposes as network as network people, I don't think it is a really good distinction between like what's an ASIC and what's an FPGA. Mm-hmm. I think what's useful is to say that this is a forwarding engine, which means it's designed to take these Ethernet IP packets in and send them out as quickly as possible and maybe do some stuff to them, like P4 programming or whatever. But primarily, mm-hmm. we're just trying to get them in and out with deterministic latency at line rate or pretty close to line rate. And... It's a very narrow set of functionality that we're talking about here. So that's why I like that term, whereas ASIC can mean almost anything. FPGA can mean almost anything. Okay, so for the rest of this podcast, then, when you say forwarding engine, I'm going to think ASIC, but we're talking about a highly specialized chip designed to do a few things very, very fast. Correct. Yeah. You know, yeah. when we're, we're talking about network devices and someone says ASIC, I mean, Cisco still uses ASIC as a term quite a bit. So I, I know what you're talking about, but I, I I just prefer the I personally prefer the more specific term. But if we can use both terms here, Drew, from a marketing perspective, I think if we were talking to switch manufacturers and one had an ASIC and the other was FPGA based, the FPGA manufacturer would say, "Hey, if there's new features that come out from the IETF in coming yes. years, we we can probably update that thing to support that feature." And the guy with the ASIC can't; they got to spin a new ASIC. Exactly. Yeah. At this. But, but Tony, just to go back to your point, sure, network forwarding engine, that's what we're getting at, whatever that piece of silicon is. Yeah, you know, whatever you want to call it. There. Yeah, that's what we're talking about here. Now, I, going back to what we're seeing under the cover, you described the control plane CPU, probably an x86 chip of some kind, and then you know the big bad switching silicon, that, uh, that, that, that ASIC, that network forwarding engine with the great big heat sink on it. Modern switches are we talking about one great big piece of silicon or are we still talking about several different asics 
or chips uh, on the front there, Ethernet switching chips that are mapped to different front panel ports. So yeah, it used to be that it used to be the latter where we would have like a Catalyst 6500. You would open it, you pull out a line card, and there would be all these different heat sinks on it. And some would do layer two forwarding for ports one through eight. Some would do layer three forwarding for the for all of the ports. Some would do MacSec or you know whatever it was. There was all these different like customized, bespoke, very specialized chips that would go into these devices. And these days, it's primarily all baked into one. We sometimes we also call it a switch on chip SOC, but that's also used by other industry, other parts mm-hmm. of the IT industry called a, a system on chip. So. Yeah. So, but yeah, this one in most of our, like most of our top of rack end of row switches that are one or two RU are typically just one 40 inch in them, just a single chip with a lot of pins on it. And that's what, um, and, and that's what's handling all of the front facing ports and any back facing ports. So nowadays uh, we're talking about one great big piece of silicon typically. Yeah. For top of rack. And, you know, the exception there would be if we have a particularly large end of row switch or a chassis when they're a a fabric of these. Basically, there's oftentimes there's a leaf spine architecture going on inside of the inside of the chassis. And it's just uh, a grouping of these, just like a data center leaf spine architecture. Yes, uh, there's a crossbar fabric. There uh, is contention management uh, in that fabric, and uh, and so on. Pete Lumbus has a really good presentation on the Packet Pushers YouTube channel that explains a lot of exactly that architecture. It's one of the most popular videos on our channel, actually. If you just yep. uh, hit the Packet Pushers channel and uh, on YouTube and search for that, it'll come right up. And it's a great I mean, forty five minutes to an hour, something like that. True. Uh, maybe shorter, actually, uh, but yeah, it's definitely one of our most watched videos on the channel. Yeah. Um, Tony, if I could complicate things a little more, um, I know of at least one uh, switch manufacturer that is adding a DPU uh, to <laughs> to the chip pile. Is <laughs> is that something you're seeing, and and where would that go in the pipeline and so on? Um, I'm not seeing a whole lot of that. Actually, I don't know much. You know, I, I know a, a basic about the DPUs, but m- most of my knowledge is going to be on the traditional layer two, layer three data center switches, campus switches and routers and WAN routers and so forth. So I don't have a lot of expertise on the DPU part and I'm not seeing a lot of it, but you know, it may be something we see more of. We're pausing the conversation for a brief reminder that Packet Pushers has a Slack community and you can join for free. Whether you want to ask questions, share tech tips, swap stories, or just connect with other engineers, the Slack community is a friendly collegial space. Check it out at packetpushers.net slash Slack. That's packetpushers.net slash Slack. And now back to the show. Well, let's move from hardware, Tony, and start talking about what's really happening in the switch when we power it up. Uh, As well, you and I were planning this. We reviewed that there's several states that the switch goes through as you power this thing up, and it gets to the point where it can actually begin forwarding traffic. Walk us through those states. Sure. Like, you know, when you power up any kind of network device that we're talking about here, a router or a switch... At first, we'll boot up into the network operating system. So traditionally, that was iOS, but now there's a lot more. And most of them today are based off of Linux. Not all of them. You know, uh, Juniper's got some free BSD stuff. Most of them are some sort of Linux distribution that's going to run all these programs for the data plane. So every type of network device, no matter what vendor we're talking about, will generally have three states in the control plane. We have the configuration state. So typically, you know, the Cisco world, the Arista world, that's going to be running config, which is loaded up from startup config, but other vendors will have their equivalent. So how do we, what are we configuring on the device? Then we have the operational state. So the configuration state will produce the operational state. And that's the, so the configuration state turns on BGP, gives it an ASN, router ID, tells it what the peers are. And then the operational state is BGP running, forming the neighbor, forming the the peers and getting the routes from the neighbors and so forth. So that's the operational state. But so far, we haven't affected the forwarding state because there's, while they are related, they are not, they're not the same. So the operational state, you might have more than one routing protocol. You're going to have, you're going to be doing some Mac learning and all of that will get programmed into the forwarding state. Now, in these type of devices with these forwarding engines, that's going to be a forwarding table. And there's layer two forwarding tables, layer three forwarding tables. In some devices like a vSwitch, that's going to be in a software forwarding table, which is going to be, uh, it's a special 
in most cases, and I'm speaking very, very generally here, when you have some type of software or forwarder, it's going to be a specialized data structure inside RAM to make it very fast to do a lookup. So it's not, it's not going to like go through a traditional routing table, even if the device is all software, that routing table is going to program this special data memory structure that's going to be, generally speaking at least, inside stored in RAM so that it's easy to access and provides the the quickest way to respond to that query. Like, I have a MAC address, where do I send it? I have an IP address, where do I send it? So these different states, configuration state, operational state, forwarding state, are they things that I might want to consider when I'm doing troubleshooting to figure out where a problem is? Or is it just, yeah, this is only something you need to worry about as the switch is booting up? Uh, no, it's it's the, it, it goes to troubleshooting because, you know, most of the time when we've got a problem, if, if it's not DNS, it's going to be a configuration <laughs> mistake. <laughs> so, you know, when um, it, well, yeah, whenever there's any kind of network problem, you know, about half the time, it's not the network, it's something else. We just get blamed for it, but we got to prove it. Mm-hmm. But there's a couple of places where we can generally find problems if it is the network. And most often it's going to be the configuration state. We made a configuration error, wrong IP address, wrong parameter, something like that. And then with just a couple lines to fix it. And then we're going to check the operational state. What's the routing table say? What MAC addresses have I learned? And that's normally where we do a lot of our troubleshooting. But it also makes sense to be able to know how to peek into that forwarding state um, in very rare cases, but it does happen, the operational state, which is supposed to inform the forwarding state, doesn't inform it correctly. There's mm-hmm. something there's something goes wrong in the process of getting the, like, the 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 rib to the fib. So the rib is the routing information base. That's the routing table, like show IP route. And then there's the fib, and that's what actually gets programmed into the ace. I'm almost using the term ASIC. That's what gets programmed <laughs> into the forwarding agent. Put a quarter yeah. in a jar, Tony. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the pedantic jar. So, okay. so this is an important detail, I think, for people to understand if they weren't already familiar with this. Uh, rib and fib, routing information base, forwarding information base, and the uh, operational and forwarding states and how they're related. So the operational state where we're running those routing daemons, let's say, and uh, the operating system and so on. You've got to decide um, as a device where you're going to forward something. And you could have multiple routing protocols involved. You could have multiple destinations involved. There's lots of uh, policy that might uh, be brought to bear upon this to finally decide that you're going to forward and this is the port you're going to forward it out. And when you know that in your operational state, you know that in software, you haven't actually told the silicon anything. You haven't actually put that chunk into memory and uh, and populated the hardware forwarding table yet. That's the, the fib, that's the last thing that's got to get done there. You've got to put that into the forwarding information base so that it's part of the forwarding state so that you can now do that very fast lookup you were talking about earlier, Tony. Hey, I've got this Ethernet frame with a destination MAC of whatever it is. W- what port do I send that out of? And then the lookup happens and psh, off it goes, uh, or IP forwarding or MPLS forwarding, as the case may be. Um, it, it, I, I would hope most people know that, but maybe they don't, and that's why we're talking about it, Tony, right? Yeah, it's it's one of those things where we don't really we don't tend to think about it because we just we have the we just have the because it works right most of the time like ninety nine point nine percent of the time the information from the rib gets into the fib correctly and but sometimes it doesn't and and it helps to know how to to query the fib how to, to see what the forwarding tables actually look like and there's various commands from the various vendors to do so and but although most of the time like when I'm doing EVP and VXLAN troubleshooting. The fib isn't the problem, but the rib is. Usually we're not learning the the MAC address or we're not propagating the MAC address through a type two route, that kind of thing. So that typically is, you know, most of our troubleshooting is going to be done in the operational state, but it does help to know that there is a separate operational state and a forwarding state, rib and fib. Yeah. Why do we have rib and fib? Does it come down to something between Ethernet and IP or some other reason? It's speed. It's pretty insane the 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 speeds today compared to with the speeds we were dealing with in the past in terms of being able to get a packet in and out of a device. Mm-hmm. When I say packet, I'm being very broad in terms of like Ethernet or IP. Stepping down from your pedant chair to talk about yeah. Packets, well, it's yes. I mean yeah, a, a packet, an Ethernet frame is a packet, but not all packets are Ethernet frames. You know, yep. usually we talk about IP packets, but 
let's just say packet. When a when a packet gets into a network device, we have a very short amount of time to make a forwarding decision. And we need to figure that out before the next one arrives. Because think about when we talk about line rate, we you know, when we talk about bandwidth, we tend to think about like a faucet. Am I getting a little bit of water going out of that faucet or am I getting a lot of water going out of that faucet? Uh, however, in, um, in, in, in interfaces, it's just, it's one at a time. We could only send one packet at a time. We could only receive one packet at a time. So if we're talking about line rate, we're talking about the packets being back to back. By the time one packet is finished entering the interface, the next one is right behind it. So that's what we mean mm-hmm. by line rate. So there, the serialization delay of that interface is going to impact how much time we have in order to make a decision. Now, I, I put together a, a table of serialization delays and like a 1500 byte frame coming in on a T1 is 7.7 milliseconds, 7.8 milliseconds. So that's a relatively large amount of time. That's why we used to have to, we used to have to fragment. You remember doing voice over T1 lines? If we were doing like voice over IP, we would have to fragment our 1500 byte packets because they took too long. We had to chop them up so we could stick some voice packets in there. Hmm. But so a 1500 byte packet comes in on a T1 line, 7.7 milliseconds. But um, in terms of like a hundred gigabit interface, it's 240 nanoseconds. So if a 1500 byte frame comes in on an interface running at hundred gig, we have 120 nanoseconds to make a decision. That's not a lot of time. Um, if it's a, a, you know, a bad case scenario, like at 80 bytes, then we only have 6.4 nanoseconds to make a decision. And, and a clock cycle on a gigahertz processor is one nanosecond. So that's for like a generalized CPU. We don't have the time. We can't make those memory lookups because it takes more than one clock cycle. It depends on if you have a cache shed or whatever to make a, a forwarding decision. So we have to gather the information about the routes, about the LPMs, longest prefix matches. We have to gather information about the MAC addresses. So we have this information, but now we need to put it someplace where we're going to be able to make a forwarding decision before the next packet arrives. And there's only a couple of places that we can do that. And they're very specialized. So that's where the, uh, the special silicon for the forwarding engine comes in. It's for this FIB. That's what it's very good at doing. Right. So FIB is a, is a generic term, and it's a good one. I like I like the term FIB um, because it can mean a couple of different types of things. Um, traditionally, for layer two, it's meant a CAM table, a content addressable memory. It's a type mm-hmm. of memory that's different from SRAM or DRAM and that it doesn't matter how big that table is, how, how many entries you have in that table, I can come back with a forwarding decision in one clock cycle. It takes one clock cycle to search the entire table and get a match or not a match. And so that's why switches were so good at switching. That's why they still are, because we still use cam memory or something like it today in our switches. Everything from like the little, um, the little like uh, Linksys router you have, your Wi-Fi access point at home, you've got those four ports on the back of it, the, you know, the built-in switch. Mm-hmm. A lot of the time they use cam memory. They're not very big tables. I think they're like a thousand entries or something like that, but they're, they're pretty sure they've got cam memory in there because it's, been around for a long time but and then you've got your large switches your large devices like your you know your uh your multi-slot chassis that got like 10 slots can have hundreds and hundreds of interfaces and those use cam memory as well because it's really good when you get a we get a frame that comes in we need to make a forwarding decision before the next packet before the next frame arrives in this case and i say frame because when cam memory we're talking only about layer two because cam memory can either match an address or none of an address. It can't match part of an address. Mm-hmm. So how many of you have, uh, have you ever heard that MPLS is faster than routing or something to that effect? Yeah. Yes. Um, that, that, that was the point of MPLS back in the day uh, yeah. that it was faster than IP routing and it, it solved a number of different problems. Yeah. Right. And that's no longer the case today because back back then when MPLS was like first, be, you know, MPLS had many purposes and it still is useful today. But one of the advantages to MPLS that is no longer an advantage today is that MPLS could be label switched. So back in the 90s, routers had to do lookups in CPU and RAM. Mm-hmm. 
they didn't have this CAM table because CAM could either match an entire address or none of an address. So a, a packet would come into a device, and if it was an MPLS label, we could just do a label match because MPLS labels, we match the entire label or none of the label. So you could put that in. You had switches that had CAM tables, the hardware inside the, the forwarding engines. You could just say, instead of looking at MAC addresses, look up, put in these, program in these uh, MPLS labels. And that's why they were faster. So your P routers in an MPLS network, the ones that aren't doing the NCAP or DCAP or popping or pushing labels, they could they could forward easily. It was a it was super easy, barely an inconvenience for them because they were doing it in CAM. But as soon as you had to do a longest prefix match, which is an IP route lookup, that had to go into a CPU and into RAM. And, there, and then we get into like, uh, we have to put it in a special type of data structure and memory. And we have to do, be able to do a quick hash lookup on it inside of SRAM or DRAM. And we, we were limited by the CPU uh, speeds at the time, which were in the dozens of hundreds of megahertz that really limited our ability to do layer three. Remember back in like the nineties, we had switches, we had routers, and there was a big difference in their capability in their, in their not capabilities. Yeah. There was a big difference in their forwarding capacity, like layer two, we had a ton of forwarding capacity because we used cam memory to do those lookups and we could mm. packet would come in or frame would come in. We would know what to do with it before the next frame arrived. But for layer three, we had to go to a CPU and it took a lot lo- there, our ability to service those packets was greatly reduced because we had to go through traditional RAM and a CPU with clock cycles. Yeah, they were they were very different types of devices, but very different purposes back in the day. And even though some of that kind of carries forward today, it's it, it's as you say, Tony. There, practically speaking, when you get under the hood, there isn't a lot of difference. Um, yeah. Tony, there's another term we haven't hit yet that I think people who have run into discussions online about RIB and FIB or been reading in networking books, uh, that is Ceph. Can you talk about that acronym and uh, explain how that fits into this conversation we've been having, if at all, at this point? Yeah. So Ceph, uh, Cisco Express Forwarding, it's, it's you know, it used to be a thing um, back in the 90s, and now it's not a thing because it's always a thing. Like right. everyone's got... Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, you know, back when, um, you know, it's something you always turned on and it was just the way that it handled those lookups. So, you know, packet would come in and it would, there was distributed Ceph because uh, one of the ways that we could scale this limited capability of our forwarding engines of our forwarding generalized CPUs for layer three back in like the late nineties, early two thousands was we would just distribute it amongst many line cards. Instead of having one route processor on a chassis, you would have the route processors distributed through the line cards, which could give you some more uh, more throughput, um, even though we were still doing CPU and RAM in terms of our lookups for layer three. And there was a special way that they would handle it, talking, you know, speaking very generalized here, there's a way that you could make a lookup much faster on a CPU by putting it into a hash table special type of data structure inside of RAM so that the lookups happen very quickly. And that was going, that they became the FIB, whereas the RIB was the, the routing tables pulling all the routes together. Um, The RIB, uh, you know, the routing protocols, you know, think about we might run BGP and OSPF simultaneously, and then through distances and and preferences, we'll pick one route over another, and that will go into the overall RIB and that gets programmed into a FIB, whether that's going to be a, a hash table in RAM or it's going to be on a 40 engine in like CAM or TCAM. I, I don't even know if it's on any of the Cisco blueprints for like their exams anymore, but it's uh, pretty much everyone does something like Ceph. So it's not a Cisco thing. It's not a, uh, it's not a Cisco only thing. It's not, it's like, oh, I'm going to buy this switch because it's got Ceph. Like, you know, they all, they'll do something like <laughs> Ceph. Cisco just had a specific name for it. And like, I, I don't know for sure if they were like the only one doing it initially, who knows? I, you know, it's lost to history, at least, uh, at least to me, but, um, not really a thing anymore because it's always a thing. Yeah. I, I bring it up just because of how long sometimes these terms hang around, even when they're not especially relevant. Yeah. I, uh, just got into a discussion with, uh, someone who was a, who was an instructor, and at a college level and he's going nuts because everyone's talking about classful routing and he's like that's not a <laughs> thing why do we have to talk about classful routing 
and I, and he's got a point. But yet, everyone that get, if you start to have that IPv4 subnetting discussion, we got to talk about classful routing. It's like, but but do you? No one does that anymore. Yeah. So I mean, it, you know. Yeah, it is, and it only hangs, you know, usually only hangs around because just of a colloquial. I don't know, I'm sure. I'm not sure if I'm using that word right, but like class C. Like, oh yeah, I've got a class C. What we merely mean is a slash twenty four, but what we really um, exactly we really in a slash notation slash twenty four, right? Yep, hundred percent. So maybe to, to tie a bow on this rib and fib discussion, um, should does the rib uh, happen on the CPU and then the CPU then programs the forwarding engine the fib? Uh, yes. Well, it depends on where the fib is. So the FIB could either be in a specialized forwarding engine type hardware with CAM and TCAM. We haven't talked about TCAM yet, but we'll talk about that in a second. So it goes into, um, so the RIB is just, we have a lot of time in the RIB. RIB is not, we don't have, uh, you know, we've got ages to build the RIB in terms of the the peers and the neighbors and the adjacencies and receiving the routes and route types and compiling right. it all into a list and, and you know, tying it up into a neat, nice package into the rib. And then we go about um, putting that rib into implementing that rib into the fib. The fib can exist, generally speaking, in two places, in hardware or in software. So when we mean hardware, typically we're talking about cam memory, where we can do a single clock cycle, you know, we can do a search of that fib in a single clock cycle, or we're putting it into a highly specialized, very structured um, place in RAM so that we can do a lookup very, very fast. Because you don't want to, you know, RAM, you want to make sure that your FIB, if it's going to be in RAM, is going to be very nicely ordered, all sequential. We've got a hash table to find the entries. We don't want it like a little bit over here and a little bit over there because it'll mm -hmm. take forever to do that lookup. Like if I do a show IP route, it doesn't really matter how long it takes for, for us to search that memory structure. Because by the time you hit enter and it comes to your eyes, you know, you know, it might take like 20 milliseconds for that. It might, or it might even take like one millisecond for that response to come from the CPU. That's no problem for us, but we don't have that kind of time for like 10 gig. We don't have that time for a hundred gig, um, depending on, or maybe, yeah, we, we don't have that time for a hundred gig. So it's gotta be fast. Um, so the fib can exist in, uh, hardware or software. And when I mean hardware, I mean, um, well, as cam. Yeah, typically cam or TCAM. So let's take a step back and talk about TCAM. So TCAM was one of the, the things that came on the scene in about the early 2000s. I think maybe even we started to see it in the late 90s, like 99. But TCAM is like cam memory, except we can do a prefix match. We can do a longest prefix match, which is what we need for routing. Because routing, we might we might have 10xxx or 10.x.x.x. We might have 10.10.x.x. We might have 10.10.10.x um, or any other combination of subnetting. And we might match part of the address, one part of the address, all of the address. So that's what that's what TCAM can do. And it has the same property as... Um, as cam memory is we can no matter how big your table is we can look up a we can look up an entry in a single clock cycle so that meant that functionally now there is no difference between layer 2 and layer 3 and that's why that 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 gave rise to the multi layer switches the mls uh, okay. so today almost every switch is a multi layer switch right um and that's why is because we have things like cam and tcam now to be more pedantic again there are other ways to do those high speed lookups that isn't TCAM because both CAM and especially TCAM, um, they take up a lot of power. They take up a lot of circuitry They're and they're, they're pretty limited in their space. Like, you know, if you've got eight gigs of Ram, you can store billions of forwarding entries, but uh, most of our forwarding engines can only handle tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands. In some case, a few million of these entries can't take a lot of them compared to what we could with Ram. So there's always, you know, there's always trade-offs. So most of the layer three forwarding is done partially in TCAM and partially in ultra low latency memory with hash tables and so forth. But we'll just call them TCAM because that distinction doesn't matter for us. It's in a very specialized hardware that is meant that will give you a forwarding decision before the next packet arrives. Got it. 
you know, so the fib is somewhere where we can make a high speed forwarding decision. And we have the term software and hardware. Software generally means that it's all going to be done in a generalized CPU, like a vSwitch on a, on a hypervisor. That's going to be software forwarding. A virtual router is going to be software forwarding. A data center switch a, is going to be hardware forwarding. A office router is often software forwarding because it doesn't need um, a general purpose CPU can handle one gig, no problem these days. Mm -hmm. You can handle 10 gig, no problem these days. But it's not going to be able to handle 100 gig very well and certainly not 400 gig. Yeah. Talk to me about a programming language like P4 that allows me to program forwarding tables directly, or at least that's how I think of it. What's really going on there um, with, with a language like P4? So P4, I I don't know a ton about P4, uh, to be honest. I, it's not how the forwarding tables get programmed. There's other ways to do that. So P4 is something else. It's like a it's like a pipeline. It's how what we do to a packet when it comes into a device. And we, we can do some things. We have some capabilities to, to do to those packets. But those P4 tables will, or, you know, the P4 engine was going to get programmed somehow because we're going to write a program in P4 and it's going to go into the chip, go into the forwarding engine. Um, there is some type of API and the different chip manufacturers have different APIs for their chips. Uh, I don't think there's an open standard one. Um, but for example, if you have a, one of the most common forwarding engine manufacturers is Broadcom. So they make the Tridents, the Tomahawks, the Jerichos. You've probably heard of those if you've worked in the data center. Um, and we have a rib in, you know, we've Arista makes switches based off these Broadcom chips. Cisco makes switches based off these Broadcom chips. Juniper makes switches based off these Broadcom chips. Just about everyone does. And there is a way to get that, that FIB programmed or to get that FIB programmed. Um. And yeah, it's, it, there's, there's some type of API to do that. And it's usually pretty hidden to us. We don't really see it. Yeah. But I mean, Broadcom publishes as open source an SDK for several of their chipsets. I don't think it yeah. covers all their chipsets, but you know, that that's out there as a thing. Um, and so it, it's the, yeah, P4, right. It's got a, it's a programming language with a limited instruction set. You can manipulate packets, do different things with them. Um, and that, those instructions have to get translated from P4 into the chipset via the API sitting in front of that chip, that manufacturer's chip. Is that the point you're making? Yeah, the yeah, we've got to get the instructions into the chip somehow. Um, so P4 is not the way to do it. Uh, P4 is the type of instructions to do, like like a packet comes into interface one and it's got you know what do we do with it? Uh, you know we we look up a MAC address, the destination MAC address. Where do we forward it to? That goes into the forwarding that goes into the cam table or whatever table um, with P4, it's uh, programming that, that ASIC, <laughs> excuse the term again, the forwarding yeah. engine. <laughs> <laughs> old habits die hard it programming that forwarding engine to do something to that besides look up the destination Mac address, IP address, look up or source Mac source, destination, source and destination Mac source, destination P address, source and destination TCP or UDP port. So some doing something else to it. Well, I think a good way to conclude this discussion, Tony, would be a packet walk. Let's go from there's a signal coming in on on the wire or on the fiber optic cable. We've got either light or we've got electricity coming in on copper, and it's going to hit the front of that switch on the front panel port. And at some point, it's going to get switched to a different port and leave. Walk us through what's happening uh, step by step, bringing all these the rest of our conversation into it. Let's focus on the hardware. Let's 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 take it with a with a switch, a piece of metal in a rack with a with a couple of chips in it, like we were describing early on. Let's start with that one, and then maybe can sure. comment on software switches and stuff. Yeah. So generally, what this process is what we call a pipeline. So as a packet frame enters a switch, there's going to be some things that are done to that packet, or evaluations are going to be done, and it depends on the and the pipelines depend on on the type of forwarding engine. No, I, I I do think it it helps to take a step back and talk about the different types of forwarding engines from the different vendors, uh, because they are different and they all have their own capabilities. And some vendors use what we call merchant silicon, which is things like Broadcom, uh, Marvel, and some others. And then some manufacturers make their own, like Cisco makes their own. They have the their cloud scale ASICs. They have their um, Cisco One. 
Uh, Juniper has their, I can't remember what they call it, but the J5. Is it some, PTX? Yeah, something. I, I can't remember what Juniper, that, but they have their own chip. Yep. Um, and then some manufacturers like Arista, they don't make their own at all. They just pull stuff from off the shelf. So there's different, these different chips. And some of them are more geared towards things like access switches, leafs. Some of them are geared more towards service providers. Some of them are, you know, depending on what you're trying to do. And there's, um, there's not a lot of them anymore. Um, the, not everyone makes these chips. There's not a lot of these manufacturers around and they make fewer and fewer varieties of these because all the features that gets put into one chip, it's cheaper to make a few chips versus uh, yeah. have a variety of, of different well, types it, of... It, it used to be not all chips could do VXLAN and cap and decap. It used to be yeah. you couldn't do VX, like VXLAN routing on all of them, yeah. et cetera. So you're, you're making the point there that different classes of chips have different capabilities. and But now we're kind of consolidating where most chips can do most things, but there's still some specialties there. Right. Yeah. There's, there's a couple of the, you know, there's, I, I, I would probably divide them into like the mainstream chips and the very specialty chips. The specialty chips are like the DPUs, the things that can do all sorts of interesting programming on them. Um, they don't tend to get mass used. They don't go into your general data center switches typically, um, or your, uh, your WAN routers or anything like that. So instead what we typically have is just a, you know, most of the switches and routers that you see, whether they're campus, data center, service provider, they're made from the same chips for the most part, the same like half dozen chips or maybe dozen. Um, like I said, you, you got the, the Broadcom. So probably the Broadcom is probably the most prolific. Um, and there's generally three families that we run into. We've got the Dune, which is like the Jericho's. Those yeah. are used for... Um, those have the the gigantic buffers, the ultra deep buffers, where you've got um, gigabytes of buffer per chip per uh, FE, and then you've got the the tridents, which are typically going to be your top of rack, end of row uh, type of devices, your your campus switches, um, and then you've got your tomahawks, which are generally going to be your service provider, your your probably going to be maybe your spines, but again, you can use any of these for anything that. You know, it's it whatever is whatever your feature needs are for that particular device. And generally, it's the buffers and the forwarding tables that determine where they go. So they all have different forwarding table sizes, anywhere from a couple dozen thousand MAC addresses and a couple hundred thousand IP addresses to millions of IP addresses. If they're going to be like a, you know, you need to have at least a million entries if you're going to take a full BGP peer. And even then, that's cut it close. So... Well, these di different chips by different manufacturers and they have different features that they can do. Some of them, like um, we were talking about in a previous episode, you had a uh, the Trident 2 from Broadcom. A lot of the first 10 gig data center switches were powered by Trident 2s. Uh, the first Cisco ACI Leafs were powered partly by the Trident 2. They used another chip in there as well, uh, a Cisco chip as well. Um and they were the first ones to be able to do VXLAN. And they came out in like 2013, I think. But they couldn't route VXLAN. They could only, um, they could only switch VXLAN. Um, because they could only in-cap VXLAN or decap VXLAN, but they couldn't do both. They couldn't pop one VXLAN header off and put another one on. Hmm. Um, so that's part of the pipeline that we're talking about. So when a packet comes into one of these forwarding engines, if it's a hardware forwarding engine, it goes through a pipeline. Um, generally speaking, we're going to divide this pipeline into a layer two pipeline and a layer three pipeline. If we're doing layer two pipeline, we can skip a lot of steps. We can get lower latency, lower port to port latency. If we do a layer two pipeline, generally, than we can do for a layer three pipeline. And then there's some crazy pipelines that are for like the ultra low latency switches for like extreme trading and stuff that are really considered layer one devices, but we're right. not going to get into that. So it comes in, we're going to, we're going to do a lookup. We're, we might uh, change something about the packet. We might change the class of service, uh, the cause tag. We might um, we might change the VLAN header. We might do VLAN uh, translation. Um, we're going to, we might have an ingress buffer, like on a VOQ type of device. So we got to sit in an ingress buffer. So we got to be placed into a particular queue. Or we might just get sent to the egress interface. 
Um, we might go through a scheduler. We might do um, something QoS related, like changing the markings, uh, putting it into a different queue, or even uh, if we're doing shaping, we just might sit in the buffer for a certain amount of time before we're let go. So there's all sorts of different things that we do inside of these, and it, generally it's called the pipeline, and every chip has a slightly different pipeline. And this pipeline is generally sitting in the FIB. Yeah, the forwarding information base is basically where to put stuff, but the pipeline is going to be um, how, a, how, you know, how the sausage gets made, so to speak. You know, how, to, how to get from one place to another and all the crazy adventures it has along the way. That's the forwarding yeah. engine we're talking about where it's specialized yeah. to do these, these lookups and, and decisions. Yeah. Yeah. The fib is like our, it's like our nav. It's, it's telling us it came in this port. It's got to go out this port. So it's passing through the chip, through the pipeline on its way to its egress port. But all these changes could be being made to that packet or to that ethernet frame along the way as it goes through, as Tony was talking about QoS markings and so on, or uh, it's QoS is ineffective, and so it's going to sit in a buffer for a little bit until enough clock cycles go by, and then it uh, then it's going to be sent. Or there's contention yeah. on an output port, and so it's got to sit in a buffer for a while until the output port is free. And now it's 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 that uh, packet's turn, and it can it can be delivered. So I don't I wouldn't think of the pipeline as inside the fib, but the fib is is part of the story that is yeah. helping that packet move through the chip to the egress port so you know where it's headed but along the way through that pipeline in the chip is uh, all of this work being done to that packet potentially or maybe it gets left alone but i mean it <laughs> yeah it, it can get changed at line rate manipulated with all of the stuff that that chip has been programmed to 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 do to that packet as it flows through it yeah there's some parts of the the pipeline that are going to be necessary like if we come in on a 100 gig interface, we're probably, we've got four lanes of 25 gig. So we've got to handle that. Um, if we, if it's layer two, it's got to do a layer two lookup. Or maybe we don't do a layer two lookup. Maybe we're doing some other special mode where we're not doing, uh, well, we're probably doing a layer two lookup. Or we're just, or we turned off Mac learning for some crazy reason and we're just spraying it across all the ports. But something's got to happen to it. There's stuff that's always going to happen to it. And then there's some optional stuff. And also the the line between a programmable uh, forwarding engine and a non-programmable forwarding engine is becoming more blurred because, I mean, technically we're programming all these. And then like the Trident 4s uh, at least have some special way that they can be programmed. There's some, there's a in-pipeline programmability and sometimes a packet's going to get VXLAN in-capped or GRE in-capped or MPLS label's going to get popped on it. All this stuff happens in the forwarding engine typically. So there's a lot going on, and it helps to know what's going on inside the chip, um, inside the affording engine. But um, more to the point, you know, usually we're looking at the fib and the rib. Another piece of the magic here to me, Tony, is uh, is going back to the idea of line rate. That is, you could be pumping traffic at line rate as fast as you can, fill traffic in a particular line, send it into that chip on all ports at the same time. And if it's a line rate chip, it can handle all that traffic uh, at once without anything getting stacked up or buffered, as long as there was no egress port contention. Exactly. And that's, you know, when we're talking about the FIB and having hardware forwarding or some type of high-speed forwarding, is because as we increase our, our speeds, we have less and less time to make that decision. Like I said, for 800 gig, even for a 1500 byte frame, which is like the best case scenario in a lot of cases, because it gives us the most amount of time to make that decision, because we have to make a decision before the next packet arrives. If it's 1500 bytes, we only have 15 nanoseconds. Wow. If it's a bad case scenario for 800 gig, we have eight for like an 80 byte packet, we have 0.8 nanoseconds, 800 picoseconds. So we really have to make a quick decision here. And there's less and less type of hardware that can do that, that can pull that off. Like TCAM, like I said, can do it in a clock cycle, but then your clock cycles have to be fast enough to be able to do that. And, you know, we're starting to get into some limitations here, I think. But um, like, like uh, physics, you mean, like science yeah, like says we, can't, yeah, we like, can't do this. Yeah, like, um, you know, uh, a one gigahertz CPU, uh, one clock cycle takes one nanosecond. Uh, a 3.5 gigahertz CPU, one clock cycle takes 0.29 nanoseconds or 290 picoseconds. So, like, can you do a forwarding decision in that amount of time if we have that, even if we're doing CAM or TCAM, which, like I said, we can return a 
an address and a clock cycle. So Does it became silicon a, photonics help us with any of this? I don't know. I have no idea if that if that helps out or not. Um, I don't know much about silicon photonics. Yeah, it's just starting to hit production now. We're been reading about it, but uh, not sure if it helps with that specific problem related to physics. I know it supposedly helps with uh, yeah. heat power consumption on some level. Um, whether it helps with actually speed of a packet port to port latency, I'm I'm not sure. Either. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it's it's kind of interesting. Like, remember when we used to care about cut through versus path, you know, cut through switching versus stored <laughs> yeah, forward? Yeah, I do. Yeah, who, yeah. Who cares anymore? Because these when we're talking about gigabit, we're you know, the the serial the delay, the amount of time it spends in the switch, cut through versus uh, store and forward doesn't matter because it's so tiny. And especially when we get into twenty five gig and a hundred gig, it's just it's just so you're not gonna unless you're doing high frequency trading, you're not gonna care. It's not going to show up in any of your reasonable application perform any of your applications and at their performance. You're not. It's not going to show up anywhere. So, um, but uh, you know, that's what we talk about. Hardware forwarders is, you know, uh, probably one of the best descriptions of a hardware forwarder because it could be TCAM, it could be something like TCAM, it could be CAM. It just we just have to be able to make that line rate decision and. And line rate can mean a couple different things. Um, some devices aren't precisely line rate. Like they won't be able to handle 64 byte packets, but who wants to send just 64 byte packets back to back? So I think like 100 bytes or 200 bytes, if you can line rate for 200 bytes, I think that's close enough to line rate that we don't have to get like, we'll just call it 200, you know, we'll just call it line rate. Now, as you look forward, we're at 800 gig now. We can buy 800 gig hardware and so on. And I saw a headline uh, scroll by about 1.6 terabit either is in testing or something along those lines from somebody. Do do we hit, uh, I mean, you mentioned in the limits of physics, do we hit a limit soon that you know of? Like you, you've actually read, we can't scale past 1.6 terabit without, you know, something, some other magic coming down the pipeline. I'm not, I'm not really up on that. So I, I couldn't tell you uh, whether or not, I just know that they are, they're, the problems are starting to stack up in terms wow. of, you know, just think, it is, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of it boggling my mind. I was, you know, I made this little, uh, the spreadsheet of the serialization delay for these different size packets for these different speeds. And it's like, we don't have a lot of time to, you know, for 10 gig, we have ages of time. We have so much time in the world, all the time in the world with a 10 gig on a 10 gig interface to make a forwarding decision. But 800 gig, we've just like 800 picoseconds bef before the next packet arrives at 80 bytes. That's crazy. <laughs> so what we got to do is tell the the Hollywood people, stop working towards 8K. We don't need it. 4K is good <laughs> enough. We can't handle that much more data. Stop it. Yeah. And, and the, you know, I, you know, Never want to say like, oh, no one's going to need more than 640 kilobytes of RAM, but like the 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 need at least in the in the in the enterprise data centers campus, you know, we we don't have a ton of need for 400 gig yet. I mean, it's it's there. We're doing it, and usually bought because of a refresh. But it's not like we're saturating those links. So, but the there's certainly like the uh, the the Amazons and the Azures, like those data centers are just pumping out crazy amounts of traffic. So they're, I think they're pro uh, I'm not, I don't know for sure, but I think that they're probably driving a lot of these speeds. Uh, they drove 25 gig. Um, they, they, they got the, the IEEE to get off their butt and make a 25 gig uh, standard mm -hmm. because they needed it. But yeah, I think they're, they're the ones driving it. The corporate enterprise is generally not driving speeds to like, beyond 100 gig, at least not right now. It'll happen, but it's just it's a much slower uh, traffic um, increase, I think. Oh, a whole other discussion we could have, Tony. I think we got to save it for another day. We're already hitting almost an hour here. Um, but we talk, software switching and what you can do in software and how the Linux kernel versus Linux user space, uh, tools like XDP, DPDK, and how they enable very fast Linux networking on a general purpose CPU is another yeah. interesting discussion, but I think it's a whole different discussion than what we've had today. Yeah. And just to like, um, in, you know, just to talk about what, what a software device, what a software device is capable of doing this capable of doing a lot today with these modern CPUs, 
and customizations and so forth, but they're not going to get to 32 ports of 100 gig. They're just, they, there's not enough PCI bandwidth. There's not enough memory bandwidth. And then the, and there's not enough cores and not enough fast cores to make these forwarding decisions at like, you know, for 80 bytes, you have 6.4 nanoseconds. One gigahertz is one nanosecond. It takes dozens of clock cycles to make a memory lookup in RAM. They're just not going to be able to to pass that amount of traffic. And I think like uh, Netflix has a great presentation on how they got 800 gigabit per second out of a single server in terms of serving up content. But it's highly specialized, highly optimized. They're not doing forwarding decisions or routing decisions. They're basically taking bytes on a SSD and then spitting it out of network interface, bypassing most of the kernel on the way. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, uh, the virtual switches, software routing, software switching, they could do a lot today with these modern CPUs and these optimizations. They can get to 10 gig, 10 gigabit, 25 gigabit, certain cases, uh, 100 gigabit for like one or two ports, but uh, they're not going to replace these top of rack devices or these uh, carrier grade routers. Tony, great discussion. Uh, thanks for pinging my DMs and saying, hey, I got an idea for a show. Let's do this one because this, this is a great conversation, great topic. Um, you want to you got parting thoughts? You want to like uh, summarize this and tie a bow on it for us? Yeah, I think probably like, you know, one of the biggest distinctions is between, between what we call hardware forwarding and software forwarding. And, you know, when you get down to the silicon and the bytes and the and the whatever, there's not a, you know, it starts to really blur together, but a hardware forwarding is when we have a highly specialized hardware that can do these lookups very, very fast uh, to do line rate off of these 32 port, 64 port, hundreds of port chassis switches and routers. So that that's what we call hardware forwarding, very limited in their functionality. They can do one thing, they do it very well. Software forwarding is something like a V switch or a router that you put on a on a, an old PC that you've got or a hyper, you know, virtual machine on a hypervisor. And they're, and they're great for one gig, 10 gig, even 25 gig these days, but they you know, if they start to struggle as you try to get faster, you start to have to really optimize them. They're just not really built for that. So that's the difference between hardware and software forwarding. But even in software forwarding, we have a separate fib and rib and, um, or we have a separate a data plane. And con we have a separate control plane and data plane, the data plane. That's where the, whether it's hardware or software, the data plane is handling, is optimized to make that forwarding decision as quickly as possible. Tony, great summary. How do people follow you on the internet? So you can follow me uh, on Twitter. Uh, I'm not going to call it X. I, <laughs> I refuse to call it X. <laughs> uh, at T Burke, at T-B-O-U-R-K-E. Um, and I blog occasionally on datacenteroverlords.com. And then you can find me on uh, YouTube. I've got a combination of skydiving videos and uh, and tech videos. Oh, that's right. Yeah, you're a you're a skydiving instructor too. Still jumping out of planes for fun, huh? Yep, I'm about to hit uh, two thousand skydives. Wow. wow, amazing! Congratulations, man. Well, again, thanks to Tony for joining us today. Thanks to you for listening to our show today. If you have questions or comments about this episode, you can send your follow-up via packetpushers.net slash FU. And while you're there, check out our other podcasts, including our brand new security show called Packet Protector, our newsletters and our blogs, all for your professional career development. That includes our YouTube channel as well, where you could watch Tony and me in a short series introducing you to EVPN. I've been Ethan Banks, along with Drew Conry Murray. You can follow us on LinkedIn, along with the Packet Pushers page. And we're also in the Packet Pushers community Slack channel, which you can sign up for at packetpushers.net slash community. Last but not least, remember that too much networking would never be enough. <laughs>